They are young and vulnerable, and many end up in bondage. Nepalese girls are being smuggled by the thousand into India every year to serve as sex workers in brothels. The profits are as high as the misery they endure. Susan Yu now looks at how Nepal has become one of the main sources of young prostitutes for the burgeoning flesh trade in South Asia. In Asia, it's a common sight. Children peddling goods and yes, even garbage to survive in places where poverty is no stranger. And also on offer is innocence. Bombay is of course the most acute and uh, especially Falkland Street, the infamous Falkland Street where you find children locked up in uh, small cages, where you find little children hidden behind uh, plywood doors, uh, where you find little children tucked away under beds and you know men are going there and demanding minors, they demand seven-year-old girls and everything. In India and Nepal, the laws of supply and demand are in full motion. Both share a busy cross-border commerce, the trafficking of young girls. The Indian government's All India Commission for Women recognizes it's a major concern. I think the problem is very serious because uh, every eighth girl in prostitution is an Nepalese girl and uh, they are coming here in uh, big numbers due to poverty conditions in their own country and also due to people who are trafficking these girls. The Coalition Against the Trafficking of Women, or CATW, reports that traffickers sell up to 10,000 Nepalese girls between the ages of 9 to 16 to brothels in India every year. It's hard to imagine, but the girls join the nearly quarter of a million Nepalese women reportedly already working in India's red light districts. I don't even call it a profession because I think it's a need because I've interviewed nearly 80,000 women in prostitution and all of them have said that they have no alternative, they have no other income a earning uh, employment source and they are, that's why they are forced into this. They have to take care of their elderly parents, aged parents and their family backgrounds and many of them are forced into prostitution because of kidnapping and other things. Other things include impoverished Nepalese parents who sometimes unknowingly sell their daughters for child marriages that end up fraudulent. For traffickers, that's one of the best ways to procure girls for bondage in the sex trade. Another are promises of employment in the big cities of Nepal and India. Here in Yurlani village in Nepal, Kanchi Tamang explains why she sold her daughter. We sold her out of greed. There are no jobs around here and we have no skills. Every day we have less and less money to survive. Just a few months ago, four girls from this village ended up in Indian brothels. Shali Tamang's sister was one of them. My uncle is in the Indian army. He told me one of our relatives was sick, so I went there. And that's when I heard from others that one of my sisters was in a brothel. In Nepal, traffickers continue to prey on villages like Yurleni. As testimony, two pimps were recently caught hiding in one of the homes here. Villager Patali Tamang was instrumental in their arrest. There are two girls in this village. The traffickers asked me and others where they were. I said they were sleeping and then they asked why we were still keeping these girls in the village. Many here have no choice but to live in abject poverty and many choose to lessen the hardships even if that means selling their flesh and blood. They will not acknowledge publicly that she's actually going off as a prostitute. It's almost something which is unsaid but accepted. It is extreme poverty which has driven um, these parents to part with their daughters. A young girl can fetch anywhere from 16 to 20 U.S. dollars to less than the price of a water buffalo. And reports abound of husbands who sell their unwanted young wives for several hundred U.S. dollars. The trafficking of young girls and women from villages is nothing new in Asia. But here in Nepal, social workers are becoming more alarmed over how sophisticated the human smuggling syndicates have become. Ruchir Gupta knows firsthand. The Indian filmmaker captured the institutionalized trafficking of Nepalese women to India in her award-winning documentary, The Selling of Innocence. I saw that this problem was so acute and almost so inhuman. 
that I decided to concentrate on this chain between Nepal and Bombay. There were rows and rows of villages in Nepal which did not have any girls from age 15 to 45. And every time that I would go to any uh, village and I would ask, where's the girl? And, you know, where is this lady or somebody I knew from earlier uh, reporting? I would be told, oh, she's gone to Bombay. And they would then be trained or broken before they were actually taken off to the red light districts. Um, being broken means that they would be raped repeatedly, they would be given drugs, they would be beaten. Despite this brutal initiation, customers covet the girls for their fair skin and oriental features. On average, they each serve up to 25 clients a day. And on the streets, the buying and selling of young Nepalese prostitutes can fetch up to 30,000 rupees or about 600 US dollars. Ibaraj Sangrula knows all too well it's a lucrative business. He assists in the rescue of girls sold for bondage. Which case stands out the most for you? Like uh, the one we encountered just two weeks, three weeks before was a girl enticed by a trafficker from a household and she was taken to uh, outside of Kathmandu, uh, promising that his nephew wanted to marry with her. And then a lot of uh, promise likes he would be given a one million rupees deposited in the bank, something like that. So after two days, we has been haunting to find out. Uh, he reported with us, and then uh, we found that she had been placed somewhere here in the northern part of Kathmandu. So we invaded the house. We found her. We came back. We brought her back to this office, and then we interviewed her. In Nepal, literacy is low, along with the traditional status of girls and anti-trafficking groups do not expect the situation will change overnight. But they do believe that the authorities on both sides of the border can and should do more to stop the sex bondage network. Well, of course, trafficking is uh, illegal totally and trafficker has to be given serious punishment. But it's such a big nexus between the, ma the mafia is so great that nobody is able to get hold of it. There are different groups uh, working here. Uh, based in Calcutta, Bombay, and this is a big ring uh, beginning from Bombay. And I think it's an underworld mafia which has a lot of finances to uh, uh, promote this, this, this market. It's the third world to the first world, and in this context, Nepal becomes the third world and India becomes the first world. So there's migration from a poorer part to a richer part. It's an issue that's caught the attention of SARC, or the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation. The government has drafted a bill now. All the SARC countries, we have drafted a bill, and we are presenting it to the SARC nations to stop trafficking. Meanwhile, anti-trafficking groups say with the help of reluctant authorities, they raid and rescue one to 200 enslaved girls every year from brothels mainly in Bombay, Calcutta, and New Delhi. For the Nepali women, their hopes and dreams end here, broken in back streets of Delhi. For those who are lucky enough to be rescued and returned home, it's a bittersweet end. Many face discrimination because most have AIDS and are shunned by their community. The numbers is increasing and among the AIDS patients in, in, in Nepal, Around 50% are those women who are being sent back from the Indian brothels. And you know, I have seen one example. There was a girl, a lady, who suffered from AIDS. And whole her family abandoned at last. And we, the healthcare providers, were only her friends at the last moment. Months after being rescued from an Indian brothel, Shali Tamang's sister died of AIDS. The traffickers who sold her were arrested and later released. That's proof justice in Nepal has a long ways to go, according to lawyer Gita Sangula, who defends victims of the sex trade. But there was no proper justice even from the court and the culprits were released. Now they are not in jail and they were not sentenced and they, start, they started harassing the victims. Back in Yuleni village in Nepal, tradition and attitudes are slowly changing. Be 
These are the sounds that signal a more promising future. For the first time, these young girls are attending school, and they're getting a second chance, like this girl who was rescued from a brothel. Once I came here to study, I know that I have to learn and I have to stay clean. The classes are being taught by members of a newly formed group called the Paralegal Committee. It uses mostly women villagers to carry out a community surveillance system to stop traffickers and even parents from preying on their young. It is still a big problem in this village, and we are still working on running this program and put more emphasis on it everywhere in Nepal. The biggest issue is education. For most of the parents here, it's a lesson that comes too late. You see, most of them have already lost their daughters. Susan Yu with some tragic tales of life for sex workers in South Asia.